Please join me in the call of worship. Delight, children of God, delight. We are delighted to be here together, to worship as a family, and to be united in the common We gather in worship to celebrate this community. We celebrate. together this day to delight in the offering of our gifts. We Give me God, 
We are ambivalent in our commitment to your kingdom. We continue to define ourselves by what we have, rather than by what we give. We long to put our lives in your hands, but are afraid to give up the illusion of control. Have mercy on us, O oh God. Commit us to a joy that comes not from holding life tightly, but from opening our hearts to serve. Each one of us. 
Following worship today, everyone is encouraged to remain for our, uh, sort of our uh, Commitment Sunday celebration downstairs in Fellowship Hall. Members of our administration committee and our board of deacons are, are hosting this enhanced coffee hour. So we hope that you will stay, we'll be socially distanced and uh, uh, everything will be handled in a safe way. But we encourage you to stay for a few moments and continue our fellowship today. I realize that when you walked in this morning, some of you probably had a panic attack when you didn't see an offering plate. Yes, we won your offering this morning just like at any other Sunday, but later in the service, everyone will be invited to bring their pledge cards forward, their offerings, whatever. If you don't have an offering on the pledge cards, we have a few coins in whatever you want, you can bring forward and place here in the front of the church in the bucket as an act of commitment and consecration. So we will do that later on in today's service. This coming Thursday, our monthly Out to Lunch group will meet at 1 o'clock at Rex's Restaurant on Telegraph Road. If you would like to join a, a group of your Cherry Hill friends for lunch, uh, we would invite you to join us Thursday at 1. If you would, please call the church office this week and let us know that you are coming. That would be very helpful. Next Sunday, immediately following the, the, the worship service, the session has called for a special meeting of the congregation. The purpose of the meeting will be to receive a report from the church nominating committee to elect elders and deacons to serve in the class of 2024 and to approve the pastor's terms of call for 2022. No other business may be brought before the congregation at this meeting. We will be hosting here at Cherry Hill this year a Thanksgiving Eve service on Wednesday evening, November 24th at 7.30 p.m. We have invited our friends from the Littlefield Presbyterian Church who have been worshiping with us. They're having their own service later this morning in our chapel, but will be back with us in a couple of weeks. Our friends from the Dearborn Congregational Church and friends from First Presbyterian Church of Dearborn to be part of this special service of Thanksgiving. I announce it today so that hopefully many Cherry Hill people will place this very special gathering on your calendars. And finally, I call your attention to the announcement in today's bulletin about our two special December, November, December mission projects our kids Santa that we are collecting toys for this year, as well as our Board of Deacons warming, warming tree, which will aid uh, students in need in our Dearborn Elementary and Middle Schools. A list of all needed items are, is in the bulletin, or you may find it on the home page of our church website, www.cherryhillchurch.org. And now may we continue in our worship.
Let us pray. Great and gentle God, giver of all life, refuge, and strength, light of the world as the days before us continue to ward ever increasing darkness and cold, make us ever more mindful of your light and warmth. Help us to see signs of your presence in the hand of a child, the gift offered, a meal delivered, a call of condolence, a truthful but much needed word, the quiet loyalty of a spouse or a tutor or a good friend or a family member. Holy God, we could use your help today. We would like to let go of our stress and our fatigue. We would like to let go of our self-criticism and our low self-esteem. We would like to let go of the fear to put ourselves out there and the worry that we might not have enough or be enough. These things are always easier said than done, God, which is why we need you. And at the same time, there are things we would like to hold close, things we would never want to give away, things we couldn't imagine forsaking. We ask for your help in that work, too. Hold us, help us hold close to those whom we love. Help us hold close to the person you call us and create us to be. Help us hold close to our faith, which we admit changes and grows with every season. Help us hold close to you. Help us hold close to hope and peace, and joy. This past week, we as a nation paused to remember veterans of all wars, and we thank you for their service for the sake of freedom. We cry out to you wishing there was no need for soldiers anywhere, but the need still exists. And so we pray for those who have lost their lives and for their families who remain. We pray for those who continue to live with haunting memories and for those with injuries and no easy access to adequate medical care. And for ourselves, dear Lord, we would ask for forgiveness because so often we have taken these ones who fight on our behalf for granted. Finally, oh God, we gather together today as many people coming from many different places, coming with many concerns, prayers, thanksgivings, on our hearts. So we ask now that you would hear us as we speak to you from the sacred silent spaces of our hearts. We bring all of our prayers before you, O oh God, holding fast to the hope that you are our sovereign God, the creator of the universe, the redeemer of all sin, and the sustainer of our lives when we don't know what or if we believe. We make our prayer in the name of your Son, our Lord. And we offer now the prayer that he taught to his disciples, praying together. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Philip answered him, 
six months' wages would not buy enough bread for each of them to get a little. One of Jesus' disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves, two fish, but what are they among so many people? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. Now there was a great deal of grass in the place, so they sat down, about 5,000 in all. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, also the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were satisfied, he told his disciples, Gather up the fragments left over, so that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up, and from the fragments of the five, Sorry about that. The barley loaves left by those who had eaten, they filled 12 baskets. And when the people saw the sign that he had, what he had done, they began to say, This is indeed the prophet who is to come into the world. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. If you were here last week, you will remember that I shared with you a comment by the Reverend Dr. William Sloan Coffin, who served for several years uh, as a senior minister of New York City's famous Riverside Church. Coffin once said that if he was ever a visitor in a church on a Sunday morning and the minister rose in the pulpit to say that he was about to preach a stewardship sermon, he, Coffin, would lower his head and pray for brevity. Well, some of you pointed out to me this week that I didn't do so well with the brevity part last week. And I apologize for that. And since God is gracious and forgiving, I ask that you would be gracious and forgiving this morning as I give this brevity thing another try. However, before I do, would you indulge me for a moment of levity? I may have shared this with you before, but it's one of my favorite stewardship stories, and I share it today in memory of a member of my first church, a man by the name of Joe Shoemaker, who just died a few weeks ago. I share it in Joe's memory because when I shared it in Mineral Ridge probably 20 years ago, over 20 years ago, really, Joe booed me from his pew. So here it goes. It seems that a couple of years ago, the Butterball Turkey Company set up a hotline around Thanksgiving so that people could call in and, and ask questions they needed answered about fixing their Thanksgiving dinner, Thanksgiving turkey, properly. Well, one lady called in and asked if a turkey that had been in her freezer for over four years would be okay. Well, a helpful person on the hotline said it wouldn't, that it would be, but the meat probably wouldn't be as good as fresh turkey, and it wouldn't have much flavor to it. And the butterball person asked her if she was going to go ahead and fix the turkey for Thanksgiving, and the lady's response was, no, I think I'll go out and buy a fresh one. So the person from the Butterball Turkey Company asked her, what are you going to do with this old, stale turkey? She replied, oh, I'll just give it to the church. <laughs> okay, so much for levity, but first let us pray. Our good and our gracious God, we ask this morning that you might use these words and this sacred ceremony of commitment and consecration of our lives 
to help every one of us take the next step on our journey of faith with Jesus Christ. To that end, O oh God, may the words that are spoken and heard and in our lives enacted be faithful and true and formed by your grace. For it is in the Savior's name that we pray. Amen. Haba Nahaba, Hajusa Kebab. I've been practicing that all week for just right this minute. <laughs> drop by drop, the bucket fills. This old Swahili proverb reminds us that every single drop counts, regardless how small. I'm sure we've all used the phrase or heard the phrase, well, it's just a drop in the bucket. A drop in the bucket usually means that, and, that it is an insufficient or inconsequential amount in comparison with what is required. A bucket contains so many drops that the addition of just one more really makes no meaningful difference. For example, let's say that a charity is raising, I don't know, they're raising money for a new building, and the building is going to cost $2 million. And we might say that our little contribution of $2 is just a drop in the bucket. It's inconsequential when compared to the need. We tend to use the expression, a drop in a bucket, whenever we feel that our contribution is too small to make a difference. Or perhaps worse, when we feel that another person's contribution to whatever is too small to make a difference. In this way, it's an expression of hopelessness or maybe pessimism. But this morning, I think what we need to know is that in the hands of an almighty God, no contribution is meaningless. None is too big. None is too small. God is not bound by the limits of anything that you or I can offer. God is more concerned with the state of our hearts and the magnitude of our contribution. I think that's the message we have in today's gospel reading. At one point in Jesus' ministry, the crowds following him became so large and demanding that the disciples and Jesus didn't even have, chance, have a chance to eat. To get away for some much-needed rest and for a much-needed dinner, Jesus decides to take the disciples on a little retreat. They cross over to the other side of the Sea of Galilee, but just as they were about to, to settle into their time alone, just as they were maybe ready to start eating dinner, they looked up and they saw a large crowd, 5,000 men, not to mention women and children, all of them coming their way. And what happened next is absolutely fascinating. When Jesus looked up and saw a large crowd coming towards him, Jesus said to Philip, where are we going to buy bread for all these people to eat? Where are we going to get them? food? Now put yourself in poor Philip's shoes for just a moment. After day upon day of nonstop ministry with hurting, needy people, you finally have a little bit of time alone for yourself. You have a little bit of time alone with Jesus to talk about your own needs. 
And then all of a sudden, 5,000 people, at least 5,000 people show up, and Jesus, the miracle worker, looks at you and asks you, now how are we going to feed all these people? Exasperated, poor Philip blurts out, Jesus, don't you see? <laughs> it's not in the budget this year. I mean, even if we had an extra six months of wages, we couldn't meet this need. It's, it's too small. Philip is, is a person who's very much in touch with his limitations. He says, but what we got, Jesus, it's, it's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to the needs of these people. Meanwhile, Andrew, he takes an inventory and he announces, well, there is a little boy over here with five barley loaves and two fish, which I've always thought was a pretty big lunch for a little kid. Um, but realizing how ridiculous his report is, realizing hey, that's just a drop in the bucket too, Andrew's voice trails off as he says, but what's that among so many people? Five little loaves of bread, two little sardines. Well, compared with the need of the crowd, it's just a drop in the bucket. However, when that little boy placed his drop in the bucket in Jesus' hands, well, those drop that. Those drops in the bucket start to add up. And by the time the day was over, 5,000 hungry men, who knows how many women and children ate, and they were satisfied. No room for dessert. And there were 12 basketfuls left over. Wow. A drop in the bucket. Adds up. Now, I don't know about you, but so often when I'm faced with all of the needs that are around me, I feel a lot like Philip. I feel like whatever I have, whatever time, whatever talents, whatever money I might have, well, it's just a drop in the bucket. I mean, almost every day I, I I hear from someone about an illness or, or maybe a cancer that's getting worse. Or I listen again to the heartbreak of someone because a spouse or a family member or a friend has died. Or I hear about someone whose life is consumed with anger or disappointment or with regret. I hear people talk about jobs that they hate but they can't afford to leave. They need their job to support their lifestyle, which they really don't like all that well either. Probably like you, you get calls, you get texts, you get emails from people finding 5,000 ways to tell you just how hungry they are. And I don't know about you, but every single time I hear from one of those people, or I read one of those emails, or I see one of those texts, I hear Jesus' voice in the back of my mind saying, Okay, Mark, what are you going to do about this? i got to tell you, I respond much the same way that old Philip did. I mean, Jesus, come on. I have nothing spectacular here to offer. At best, a little bit of heart, a vague sense of calling, a few years of education, some hard-earned experience. I mean, Jesus, come on, I, I, I only have five barley loaves and, and two little fish. Jesus, whatever I have is just a drop in the bucket. And Jesus says, okay, that's enough. In fact, it's more than I need. 
you know, just like that little unnamed boy with his laughably little amount of food, whenever our little is placed in God's hands, there's no telling what God might do with it. Our, what we perceive to be our drops in a bucket, miraculously becomes tidal waves of change and blessing when they're placed at God's disposal. God knows that even when we, we, we share what seems to us to be like a drop in the bucket, it adds up. It's truly from a place of great abundance that we can reach into our hearts and into our time and our talents and whatever gifts we might have and share with the other. This abundance doesn't come from us, but God abundantly blesses whatever it is. Five minutes, a phone call, an email, a lunch, a dinner, whatever it is that we might place in the hands of the Savior. For you know it's true. Drops in a bucket. And you know, to this day, there remains a debate among conservatives and liberals as to whether or not Jesus actually performed a miracle that day on a beautiful Galilean hillside. Some suggest that Jesus merely taught the people to start sharing the food that they always would carry with them in their cloaks. Who knows? Whatever. I believe, though, that Jesus literally performed a miracle. But frankly, it's relatively easy for me to do this because <laughs> Jesus did. The real question facing those of us who take our mission as Christians seriously is not whether or not we believe that Jesus fed the crowd 5,000 so many years ago, but the question is, will he do it again? Will Jesus take my limited resources of my time, whatever talents I might have, whatever treasure I might have, whatever it is I might place in his hands, will he take my five loaves of fish to feed the hungry, to heal the broken, and to bring a little bit of hope to the world that never seems to have enough of it? Good grief, that would take a miracle. But that's Jesus' worry. Not mine. All that we're asked to do is to take whatever it is that we have and place it in Jesus' hands. Oh, in our eyes, it might just be a drop in the bucket. But remember, in the hands of Jesus, every drop makes a big splash. Well, I just close with this. In Philadelphia, Pennsylvania in 1895, there was a little girl named Hattie Mae Wyatt. She was seated on the curb outside the Baptist church one Sunday morning, and she was sobbing. The minister of that church, the Reverend Russell H. Pondo, was hurrying into the church, hurrying to get on into worship when he saw her. He didn't know if he really had enough time to stop and help her, but he did. He asked her why she was sobbing, and as he did, she noticed that her hair was unkempt and she was shabbily dressed. She looked up at him and said, well, I wanted to go to Sunday school, but when I went in, the teacher told me there were too many children and they didn't have room for me. He replied, oh, okay. We can find a place for you. And he took her hand into his and walked her in the building, carried her through the crowd in the hall, into the Sunday school room, and found a chair for her back in the corner. The next morning, when Reverend Conwell made his way to the church, he passed Haiti, Patty May Wyatt again as she was going up the street to school. 
As they met, Reverend Conwell said, Patty, we're going to have a larger Sunday school room soon. And she said, I hope you will. It's so crowded that I'm afraid when I go there alone. Well, Reverend Conwell replied, when we get the money with which to erect a school building, we're going to construct one large enough to get all the little children in, and we're going to begin very soon to raise the money for it. It'll be very costly, but we'll start soon. And little Hattie came back again and again, week after week after week, to go to Sunday school in that Baptist church. And Russell Conwell never forgot that little girl. And he was thrilled with the church's ministry to her through the Sunday school. Well, a short time later, Hattie Mae became sick. So sick that she died as a child. Her parents were not churchgoers, and they didn't know where to turn for help, but they thought of Reverend Conwell and the church that their little girl liked so much. Well, Reverend Conwell, of course, performed the funeral and met with the family afterwards. But later on, when Hattie Mae's parents were going through her very, very meager possessions, they found a little red purse that was cracked. It was so old. And inside that little red purse was 57 cents, which was no small amount for a little girl from a poor family. And along with the 57 cents, there was a little note that read, this is for a new church building. So all the little children will have a place to learn about Jesus. And it was signed love. Hattie Mae. Well, Reverend Conwell was so touched by this that he went to his deacons and to his congregation and said, this little girl has given us seed money. Let's do it. Let's grow a church to the glory of God and in thanksgiving for little Hattie Mae. The, the deacons and some of the people in the congregation were at risk of 57 cents. It's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to what that building like that would cost even back then. But on faith, they did it. But the story doesn't end there. A real estate developer was in the congregation as a visitor that one Sunday. He heard Reverend Conwell preach about this. He was very touched by the story and after the service said to Reverend Conwell, you know, I'm going to offer you a plot of land right near the church, and I'm going to give it to your church with very good terms, low amount of money, low interest. They went to the board of deacons, and they said, well, we would love to do this, but we, we just can't afford to do it. It's beyond our means. And so this real estate developer, this is a true story. The real estate developer sold the land to the church for 57 cents. He said, I want to honor Hattie A. Wyatt's memory. So he sold it to them for 57 cents, and when the story was reported in a Philadelphia newspaper, money started to come in from all over the area. A quarter of a million dollars came in to build that new educational wing. In 1895, that was all that was needed. But today, you can go to Philadelphia. You can go to Hattie Mae's little church. Well, it's not so little anymore. It's Temple Baptist Church, which seats 3,300 people in its sanctuary. You can go to Temple University. You can go to Good Samaritan Hospital in Philadelphia, all of which was inspired by a drop in the bucket. 57 cents from a little girl who simply wanted others to learn about Jesus. Oh, and across the street from the Good Samaritan Hospital, next to the Temple Baptist Church, 
you'll see the church's education building, and in that building there's a framed photograph of Reverend Russell Conwell, and there's a framed photograph of Hattie May Hyde, who gave the church a drop in the bucket. 57 cents that God was able to use to inspire a whole new ministry. Now that's an example of how with God a drop in the bucket adds up. Okay. I'm finished now. Charles this week to play some festive pledge card bringing up music for us today. And as he does, uh, I'm going to invite you to, if you have them with you, to bring your pledge card for 2022. If you forgot it, simply raise your hand. We'll be glad to bring you one. Bring it forward with your offering today and place it in this beautiful bucket in the front of the sanctuary. If you've got your offering, bring whatever you want to bring. You know, as I consider what I put on my pledge card this year, you know, it's really just a drop in the bucket. Yet, I'll put it in the bucket with yours and with the ones we've already received, with the assurance that this is just symbolic, we're placing our, whatever it is we can offer, in the hands of God, with the faith that, small as they may seem, our drops in the bucket will add up. Every single itty bitty drop adds up. One drop adds to another, and to another, and to another, and to another, until they're multiplied by the power of Christ to do more than we can ever imagine. The only thing that will keep drops from adding up and filling the bucket would be to stop dripping, to stop making deposits. So while we enjoy Charles' festive pledge card bringing up music, I invite you to join me as we present the offerings of our life and our labor to the Lord.
eternity of dedication. O oh Lord, throughout the ages, your people have lived under, your, under the care of your covenants. We respond now in faith because you have first committed your grace to us. Accept these offerings as our pledges to live by faith in your pledge to us. We offer our church to you. Use it as a light that shines in a dark world, as your heavenly city set on a hill. We commit this church back to you because it has never belonged to us. So use what we will give to bring your church deeper into the service of Jesus Christ. Multiply and magnify these gifts to your work so that as we give in your name and spirit, we may receive a hundredfold of your blessing, which are so abundant that there is enough for all. To God be the glory. with all those whom you love, and with all those whom only God knows. 